Good evening, everybody, and welcome on behalf of Learners to tonight's annual lecture. My name is Richard Newton Chance. Now, just a bit about Learners to start off with. Before I do that, can we please all switch off our video feeds, please, and make sure that we're uh, muted as well. Thank you. Learners is a pioneering think tank promoting the understanding of how we learn by facilitating and strengthening the dialogue between researchers, practitioners, and policymakers in order to bring about an evolution in teaching and learning. Learners is dedicated to connecting educators and world leading neuroscientists who specialize in the study of the brain, the mind, and behavior in order to use the evidence and insights from high quality research in these multidisciplinary fields to improve and enrich teaching and learning for all. To that end, we are absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Kimberly Noble to present this year's annual lecture. Dr. Noble is a professor of neuroscience and education at Teachers College, Columbia University. As a neuroscientist and board certified pediatrician, she studies how socioeconomic inequality relates to children's cognitive and brain development. Her work examines socioeconomic disparities in cognitive development, as well as brain structure and function across infancy, childhood, and adolescence. She has funding from the NIH and more than a dozen private foundations, and is one of the principal investigators of Baby's First Years, the first clinical trial of poverty reduction in the first three years of life. Dr. Noble received her undergraduate, graduate and medical degrees at the University of Pennsylvania. She was the recipient of the Association for Psychological Science, Janet Taylor Spence Award for transformative early career contributions. The American Psychological Association Award for distinguished contributions to psychology in the public interest and is a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science. Her TED talk has received more than 2 million views to date, and her work has received worldwide attention in the popular press. Tonight's lecture is entitled, Socioeconomic Inequality and Children's Brain Development. Understanding the impact of socioeconomics on children's cognitive, emotional, and neural development in the first three years of life. Finally, before I hand over to Dr. Noble, can I ask you to make sure you are muted and to post any questions you may have via the chat facility, and we'll deal with those at the end. Thank you. Welcome to Dr. Noble. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Richard. It's really a, quite a pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful for the invitation. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides now be able to see that. So the human brain has been termed the most complex three pounds in the universe. And it's not hard to see why when we consider the fact that we're born with 100 billion neurons or brain cells, and we develop between 250,000 and 500,000 new brain cells every minute in the first few months of life. And it turns out that most early brain growth in childhood isn't because of the development of new brain cells, but the connections between brain cells. And these brain connections become increasingly complex in the first several years of life. So here's a picture of brain cells under the microscope at birth, at three months, and at two years of age. You can see this increasing complexity in early childhood such that by age three, we have a thousand trillion connections between our cells. Now, as a neuroscientist, what I find particularly fascinating is that early experience shapes this brain development process. So the brain is arguably most plastic or malleable to experience early in childhood. And of course, a child's experience varies tremendously as a function of his or her family's social and economic circumstance. And so we can use social and economic factors as a lens through which to better understand early brain plasticity. And so taking a step back, I study how poverty relates to child development, but what do we actually mean by poverty? Well, 
Here in the US, poverty is defined as a lack of economic resources needed to attain a minimal standard of living. And the United States federal government sets poverty thresholds according to family size and composition, meaning the number of adults and children in the home. So currently a family with two adults and two children has the poverty line set for them at just over $26,000 or just under 20,000 pounds. Um, and although that's quite a difficult uh, amount to imagine raising a family of four on, it's nonetheless quite prevalent. So uh, here, as we can see uh, in the US, currently children uh, are living in poverty at a rate of about 16% as compared to all individuals who are living in poverty at rates of about 11%. So children uh, in the US are about 50% more likely to be in poverty than our adults. Um, now, in researching uh, some background information for these slides, I learned that in the UK, poverty is commonly defined as either relative low income, defined as being below 60% of the median in that year, or absolute low income, uh, defined as being below 60% of the inflation adjusted median in a base year. So they commonly use 2010 as that base year. And by those metrics, uh, nearly a third of children in the UK are living in poverty currently. I was quite surprised by that statistic. I thought surely uh, US children will be living it, uh, in poverty at higher rates, um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Now, when we talk about socioeconomic status or SES, we're talking about more than just poverty. So I just told you that poverty is defined based on family income, whereas SES is defined based on income, but several other characteristics as well. Things like parents' educational attainment, occupational prestige, and subjective social status, or where one sees oneself on the social hierarchy. I mean, oh, excuse me. Ah. And we know that when childhood SES is measured in this way, it tends to be associated with a number of important cognitive developmental outcomes. Things like achievement test scores, grade retention, literacy, IQ, and school graduation rates. And now the data I'm about to show you come from the British cohort study of 1970, which followed tens of thousands of children in the UK longitudinally from about age two to about age 10. And these data show us that this socioeconomic gap in achievement tends to emerge early and widen throughout the elementary oh, years. So uh, walking you through these data, I'm gonna first point your attention to children who started out at age two, scoring at the 90th percentile on a battery of cognitive tests, meaning that they outperformed 90% of other two-year-olds on this cognitive battery. Why do we close out? I'm first going to draw your attention to children who performed at the 90th percentile, who came from socioeconomically advantaged backgrounds. So those children who were from higher SES backgrounds, who were from who were high early scorers, tended to perform above average throughout much of the course of childhood. Next, let's consider children who started out performing at the 10th percentile relative to other two-year-olds, who happened to come from socioeconomically disadvantaged homes. So those children who were from lower SES backgrounds, who were low early scorers, tended to perform below average throughout much of the course of childhood. So far, nothing I've shown you is tremendously surprising. A bit more surprising, though, is what happened to what we might term the crossover groups. So next, let's consider children who also started out performing at the 10th percentile at age two, but who happened to come from socioeconomically advantaged backgrounds. So oh, those yeah. children actually broke oh, their relative ranking over the course of childhood, such that uh, by age 10, they were performing at or even a little bit above average. And finally, and most disconcertingly, uh, let's take a look at what happened to those children who started out performing better than 90% of other oh, kids. How do I get to see them? But who happened to come from socioeconomically disadvantaged. I assume talking. I'm just going to ask if you're not muted, if you could think about what you just asked me. Which one the worst? They've got the Zoom button at the bottom of the screen. So here we see that those children who started out outperforming 90% of other two year olds, but who came from disadvantaged backgrounds, you actually it? fell in their relative ranking oh, no. over the course of childhood. So you said by age 10, family socioeconomic circumstance was a much better predictor of cognitive development than was early cognitive skill. 
So I think that's a particularly striking illustration of the emergence of socioeconomic disparities over the course of early to middle childhood, but it doesn't really tell us anything about why. What factors might be contributing to this socioeconomic gap in achievement? And we can think of many differences in things like nutrition, uh, access to healthcare, exposure to environmental toxicants like secondhand smoke or lead, differences in the home learning environment or early schooling or family stress. And to the, this list and the many others that you all could likely come up with, I would say yes, really each of these has been shown to contribute in part to the link between socioeconomic factors and cognitive skill. So how do we make sense of that? Well, one way is to recognize that so-called cognitive skill is really too broad of an outcome to be considering, by which I mean that traditional achievement measures like high school graduation aren't specific in terms of brain function. There's no high school graduation part of our brain. Uh, in contrast, we can ask which particular cognitive skills and corresponding brain circuitry seems to vary the most with socioeconomic factors. And so that really brings us to a neuroscience approach. So neuroscience teaches us that different structures and circuits in the brain support different kinds of cognitive skills. And so by taking a neuroscience approach, we can ask which core cognitive systems are most highly associated with socioeconomic factors. And so that was exactly the approach that my collaborators and I took uh, more than 20 years ago now. Uh, when we recruited several socioeconomically diverse groups of families with young children, and we administered a battery of neurocognitive tasks that were designed to selectively tap into some brain systems more than others. And across these different cohorts of families, we found pretty consistent results, whereby family socioeconomic background was consistently associated with children's language development, and more modestly, but still consistently associated with children's memory development, as well as certain aspects of executive function, meaning the ability to control impulses and stay on task. And so building off of that early work, my lab has set out to address four main questions in our research program. Number one, how do these differences relate to underlying differences in children's brain structure and function? Number two, just how early in childhood are these socioeconomic disparities detectable? We reasoned that if our early work started when children were in kindergarten and we were already seeing differences, these differences must emerge earlier, but when? Number three, which differences, particularly uh, uh, modifiable experiences, seem to account for socioeconomic differences in cognitive and brain development? And finally, number four, how can this work inform interventions? And so we'll, we'll touch on each of these questions in turn. So number one, how do these differences relate to underlying differences in children's brain structure? Uh, so this was, these are data I'm about to show you from a study that we did a few years ago in collaboration with the Pediatric Imaging Neurocognition and Genetics, or PING, uh, investigators who at the time had done something quite unprecedented. So they recruited more than a thousand children and teens from all across the US to participate in high resolution MRI scanning uh, with the goal being that they were really going to map out how uh, normal aging across childhood and adolescence relates to differences in children's brain structure. Believe it or not, uh, that question had never been asked before on that scale. So we were able to take advantage of the fact that these children and adolescents recruited for this study came from very socioeconomically diverse homes around the United States. So we were able to secondarily ask, to what extent do family social and economic characteristics relate to the structure of children's brains? Now, to orient you for those who may not be used to looking at MRI images, uh, these are averages of the brains of those thousand plus children and teens. This is the front of the brain, this is the back, this is a view along the lateral or side surface. Here again, this is the front of the brain and this is the back, and this is a view along the medial or straight down the middle surface. And so we asked to what extent would we see associations between family socioeconomic factors and children's brain structure throughout the brain. So here, every point you see in color is a point where higher family income 
was associated with a larger surface area of the cerebral cortex or the thin layer of cells on the outer surface of the brain that does most of our cognitive heavy lifting. So you can see that this relationship between family income and children's brain structure was visible across nearly the entire surface of the brain. And there are some regions shown in yellow where this relationship was particularly pronounced. Areas uh, like in the inferior frontal gyrus and parts of the temporal lobe that support language development, as well as areas uh, like the anterior cingulate cortex that's very important for executive function, how we regulate our thoughts and feelings. Now, there are a few points that are important to take away from these findings. Number one, this association between family income and children's brain structure was strongest among the most disadvantaged children. And intuitively, that makes sense, right? An extra 10,000 pounds for a family earning 100,000 pounds a year would certainly be nice, but probably would not make a dramatic difference in their day-to-day -day lives. Whereas an extra 10,000 pounds for a family only earning 20,000 pounds a year would probably make a pretty remarkable difference in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and the second key takeaway is that there was tremendous variability from one child to the next, by which I mean there were plenty of children from higher income homes with smaller brain surfaces and plenty of children from lower income homes with larger brain surfaces. So in no way could I know an individual child's family income and predict with any accuracy what that particular child's brain would look like. Okay, uh, moving on to our next research question, just how early are these effects detectable? Uh, so first I'm gonna show you some uh, work that we did with infants and toddlers looking at language and memory development. So we followed a group of young children longitudinally from nine to 15 or 15 to 21 months of age. And we mapped out over the course of this time, their trajectories in uh, language development. So here on the y-axis, these scores are in z-scores, which means, <clears throat> excuse me, that a score of zero means they are performing at uh, the average level for a child of that age. And so what you can see is that from nine to 15 months, these lines are pretty flat meaning we're not really seeing the emergence of disparities in language development just yet. But from 15 to 21 months of age, we're seeing that that blue line is rising to the top of the distribution, uh, representing children of the most highly educated parents. And this green line, representing children of the least educated parents in the sample, is unfortunately falling to the bottom of the distribution. So what does that mean practically? Well, by 21 months of age, that difference between the blue line and the green line is equivalent in magnitude to 12 IQ points. Now, this wasn't an IQ test, it was a test of language ability, but that nonetheless gives you a sense of just how large the differences already are before children even turn two. Now, what about taking a look under the hood and trying to understand early brain development in addition to early behavioral development? Well, the pictures I showed you before were taken using MRI. If you've ever had an MRI, you know it involves sitting perfectly still in a dark and noisy tube, which is fine for adults or older children, not great for infants and toddlers. Uh, so with infants and toddlers, we break out another tool in our toolbox, namely electroencephalography or EEG. Uh, we place this stretchy cap of electrodes on the child's head uh, and those electrodes amplify the electrical signal at the scalp which reflects the underlying electrical activity of the brain. Uh, it's a great way to measure brain activity in young children. It's safe, it's fast, it's relatively simple. And we get as an output this squiggly line known as a brain wave. We can then use computer software to decompose this brain wave uh, into different kinds of brain waves. And everybody has some of everything, some fast moving high frequency brain waves, some slower moving lower frequency brain waves. Uh, and so while everybody has some of everything, we also know that the relative proportion of these different brain waves matters. Specifically, we know from past work from other laboratories that children who are at risk for learning and attention problems often tend to exhibit less higher frequency power and more lower frequency power. Likewise, a number of studies now have suggested that many children living in economic disadvantaged context, economically disadvantaged contexts often exhibit less high frequency power and more low frequency 
So this is an example uh, of a study uh, from the UK. Uh, lead author was Tamal Skiadal, uh, in which they recruited a sample of families with infants from London, and they divided their sample into families with lower income and higher income. Uh, so here, if you would imagine uh, these circles reflecting an average of the brains of the infants in the study, here you can imagine that the infants are lying on their back with their feet into the screen. So this is the back of the head, this is the front of the head, the nose, this is, these are the two sides of the head. And uh, what I'm going to show you in a moment is a mapping of that high frequency power across the head of these infants. Um, and so it's a little subtle, but what you can see is that in the infants from higher income homes, you're seeing a bit more high frequency power at the front of the head compared to the infants from lower income homes. Now, a few years ago, uh, I had a wonderful postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Natalie Brito, who's now uh, an assistant professor in her own right at New York University, who wanted to really push the envelope and ask just how early would we see socioeconomic differences in infant brain activity? And so she recruited a, a sample of families with newborns. And she asked, to what extent do we see associations between family socioeconomic factors and newborn brain activity? And her answer was around resounding none. So she found absolutely no evidence of any link between either parents' education and or family income and brain activity anywhere across the brain in any frequency band. So uh, this suggests that any differences that subsequently emerge may be the result of experience because we're not seeing these differences at birth. Uh, and indeed, in a different sample of infants who she recruited uh, who were between six and 12 months of age, she did begin to see associations between socioeconomic factors and infant brain activity later in the first year of life. So there's some suggestion that something about differences in experience as early as the first year of life may be leading to differences in brain development patterns. And so if we're right, and experience might be accounting for some of these links, it begs the question as to which experiences are causing these differences. Uh, so I showed you this slide before. Of course, there are many possible experiences that may be at play. I, in my lab, we're particularly interested in two of these, namely the home language environment and family stress. So focusing first on the home language environment, some of you may be familiar with uh, this work by Hart and Risley, who uh, in the mid 1990s did something that had never been done before. Uh, they followed a group of families longitudinally for the first several years of their children's lives. And every month they went into these families' homes to tape record for a couple of hours every word that the child heard and every word that the child spoke. Uh, they then brought their tapes back to the lab, transcribed them, and they found that at every age, children from the more advantaged backgrounds tended to hear more words than children from the less advantaged backgrounds. And so extrapolating that difference out over every waking hour over the first several years of life, the authors calculated that this amounted to a 30 million word gap in terms of the number of words heard by the more advantaged children compared to the less advantaged children. Now, the specifics of that 30 million number have been uh, the subject of much debate in recent years. It's probably an overestimation. Uh, but nonetheless, the evidence is pretty consistent that the number as well as the complexity and responsiveness or back and forth verbal conversational interaction seen tends to vary along socioeconomic lines. Likewise, the number of words children hear tends to be directly related to their vocabulary size. And I showed you a few moments ago that parts of the brain where we see the most dramatic socioeconomic disparities are parts that support language development. And so we reason that perhaps these differences in the whole language environment might account for socioeconomic differences in children's brain development. Uh, now we had it a little bit easier than Hart and Risley who had to transcribe everything. Uh, instead, we used this little device known as the LENA, which stands for the Language Environment Analysis Tool. It's essentially a small digital recorder that the child wears for up to 16 hours. They then give it back to us and uh, the LENA computer software uh, analyzes and tells us how many words are they hearing over the course of the day. 
It also tells us how many vocalizations they make, as well as how many conversational terms or back and forth verbal interactions with an adult they're experiencing. And so uh, work led by another former postdoctoral scholar of mine, Dr. Emily Mers, who's now at Colorado State University, suggested that children who experienced more conversational terms had a larger brain structure in this language supporting region. Um, now, what about other potential mechanisms explaining socioeconomic differences in uh, children's brain outcomes? So we're also very interested in family stress in my lab. Uh, we know that when uh, family life is characterized by stress, parent-child interactions often don't contain the kinds of warm and nurturing parenting that we know is so important for children. Uh, we and others have shown that socioeconomically disadvantaged children often have altered levels of stress hormones. And uh, it's very clear both in the animal and the human literature that there are certain brain regions that are highly sensitive to stress. Regions like this one shown here in green, which is the hippocampus, a key structure for learning and memory. And regions like this one shown here in yellow, part of the prefrontal cortex, which is important for executive function and self-regulation. And so we reasoned that perhaps these differences in exposure to chronic stress might account for socioeconomic differences in these brain regions. Uh, so how do we measure chronic stress? Well, we ask families about their perceptions and experiences of stress. And we also measure stress hormone or cortisol, which we can do by taking a small sample of hair. Um, and so it turns out that children who have higher levels of stress hormone as measured in their hair, tend to have a smaller hippocampal volume, that region that we know is sensitive to stress and is also very important for learning and memory. And this really supports what we see in the animal literature where animals who are exposed to stress or stress hormone often have a smaller hippocampus. And so uh, what I uh, briefly tried to lay out is that we think that differences, socioeconomic disparities, lead to differences in experience, which in turn work together to shape children's brain and ultimately cognitive development. And now if we're right and experience matters, it begs the question as to whether this work can inform interventions, and if so, what's the right level at which to intervene? Uh, so certainly we could imagine intervening at the level of cognition itself, most commonly through school-based interventions, and there are many excellent examples of school-based interve interventions that can be effective. Um, however, as any intervention scientist would tell you, uh, school-based interventions are often uh, labor-intensive, they can be costly, uh, and they often suffer from something known as fade out, which is the idea that uh, you may see differences shortly after the cessation of your intervention, but then if you go back to those same children a year later, you often no longer see the effects. Now, what about intervening at the level of experience? Shortly, there's a wealth of knowledge uh, centered on changing experience to improve children's outcomes, everything from uh, mental health supports to parents, to reducing lead in the environment, to uh, nutrition interventions, um, to interventions designed to encourage parents to read more with their children. Certainly, again, a number of these uh, have been shown to be somewhat effective. Um, again, it can be labor intensive and costly to do these kinds of interventions at scale, and it can be difficult to enroll families into family-based interventions, right? It's difficult to enroll and difficult to maintain families engaged in your intervention. So for the next part of the talk, I'm gonna challenge you to think about what it might be like to target socioeconomic disparities themselves. So work by uh, some of my collaborators has suggested that relatively modest differences in annual family income in childhood predict better outcomes when those children grow up. So for example, just $4,000 difference between the prenatal year and age two predicts improved cognitive development, increased adult earnings when those children grow up, increased time spent in the labor force, and even some evidence of improved adult health. Uh, however, uh, those studies are all based on correlations, right? So we can say that poverty is associated with certain outcomes, but to date, we can't say definitively whether poverty is causing those outcomes. And there are many people out there who would say, well, it's not poverty, it's whether you're willing to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. One might argue that babies don't have bootstraps, but regardless, the only uh, 
truly scientifically valid way to assess that question is through the gold standard of scientific design study, a randomized control trial. And so that's exactly what we're doing with the baby's first year study, which is the first randomized controlled trial of poverty reduction in early childhood. So what are we actually doing? Uh, we recruited a thousand low-income mothers shortly after they gave birth in a number of hospitals around the United States. Uh, upon enrolling in the study, all participants were told that they would receive a monthly unconditional cash gift for the first several years of their children's lives. Importantly, moms were randomized into one of two groups. The group we call the high cash gift group is receiving $333 a month or $4,000 a year. And I apologize, I didn't put the, uh, the currency in pounds there. Um, and the group that we're calling the low cash gift group is receiving $20 a month or $240 a year. So that difference in annual income is the amount that uh, my social science colleagues have found to be associated with improved cognitive development previously. Uh, so they get this money via a debit card that comes preloaded in the hospital and that automatically reloads each month. Um, and to date, we've given out more than $5 million uh, to the low-income mothers in our study. And so by following the different trajectories of these two groups, we'll be able to assess the causal impact of poverty reduction on children's cognitive, emotional, and brain development in the first several years of life when we believe that the developing brain may be most malleable to experience. Now, how do we expect that the, these increased economic resources likely play out in families? Well, we've got two main pathways that we're hypothesizing. The first we call the increased investment pathway. And this is the idea that with greater economic resources, moms are more likely to be able to buy uh, books and toys, perhaps uh, uh, higher quality childcare, perhaps better housing in safer neighborhoods. And the other we're calling the reduced stress pathway. And that's the idea that if moms are less worried about how they're gonna make that monthly rent check or keep the lights on, they're more likely to be able to engage with their children in the kinds of warm and nurturing ways that we know are so important for child development. Now, chances are these two pathways operate differently in different families. And so while we're measuring them very carefully along the way, our ultimate outcomes of interest really center on the children. Okay, so this is just uh, sort of a map showing where we are in the data collection process. So we recruited the families over the space of a year beginning in the spring of 2018. We then uh, followed up with their children, with the families as their children were turning one. Uh, at the one-year-old visit, initially we were going into the homes of the families to administer a survey, to observe and video record parent-child interactions, to get a measure of mom's stress hormone, uh, to get some basic measures of children's language and social emotional development, and excuse me, to get a measure of brain activity in the children. Now, of course, uh, in March of 2020, which was partway through these age one visits, the world turned upside down. So uh, from that point forward, we weren't able to go into the homes of the families. And instead, we, we were able to collect information via phone only. I'm happy to say that our retention rates have nonetheless been quite high. So we uh, managed to collect data from more than 90% of the families, um, both at age one and at age two. We're currently in the midst of our age three follow-up, again, by phone, uh, which again, our retention rates are uh, looking quite good. Um, and we're very actively gearing up for our next wave of assessment, which we're planning to be an in-person wave of assessment beginning when the children begin to turn four uh, this coming summer. And so uh, this summer, we'll be starting to bring the families into our university laboratory settings uh, so that we can do a direct assessment of children's cognitive, emotional, and brain development uh, in person. I mentioned that the uh, cash gifts have been distributed on a debit card. It's branded as For My Baby. Uh, the cards are automatically activated in the hospital and then uh, automatically reloaded each month on the day of the child's birth date. And the mom gets a text message when the reload happens each month. Uh, these cash gifts were funded by charitable sources, which means that they're not taxable. They're truly considered gifts in the legal sense of the word. Uh, and we worked very hard to ensure that to the extent possible, 
this money wouldn't count against moms in determining their eligibility for government services and benefits. So over the course of the first year, this is just a map showing uh, where the money was spent. You can see that um, the greatest single type of transaction was at ATMs. Uh, and one thing I like to point out is that on average, out of the $4,000 a year moms in the high cash gift group received, just $15 was spent at a tobacco or liquor store. And indeed, we're not seeing differences in reports of uh, use or spending um, of tobacco or alcohol. Now, what about infant brain development? So I'm pleased to say it was a really unprecedented and successful mobile EEG data collection effort. Uh, so typically, when we measure brain activity, we do it in controlled circumstances in the lab, but we were able to uh, take these devices into the homes. The majority of families agreed to try it. Uh, in 84% of in-person visits, the babies were successfully capped, and we uh, were able to obtain high-quality usable data in about 72% of the sample of 12-month-olds, uh, which is about the rate that we would expect in the university setting. So we were really quite pleased with that. Now, as a reminder, how has past work suggested that poverty is related to brain development? Uh, so past work has suggested that poverty is associated with less higher frequency power and more lower frequency power. And that's important because that pattern has been associated with subsequent learning and attention difficulties in school. And so we have been testing to what extent will cash gifts reverse this pattern, uh, suggesting more higher frequency and less lower frequency power. And so while uh, these results have not been published yet, so I'm not going to be uh, sharing the exact results today, I can tell you that we're seeing some evidence in support of this after just 12 months of cash gifts. So what's next for the baby's first year study? Uh, we're currently in the midst of analyzing uh, the data at, from ages one and two. We're currently collecting data as the children are turning three. And um, what I uh, sort of glossed over before, originally the study was planned to go through child age three. So the original plan was that we would bring families into the university setting at age three. Uh, we realized some at some point during the pandemic that uh, summer of 2020, uh, excuse me, summer of 2021 still might not be uh, a time that we would be able to bring families into the universities. So we raised funds to extend the cash gifts an additional year till age four, uh, which is our current plan. And so when we bring the families into the lab, we'll be doing a state of the art assessment of child development. So it's our hope that the baby's first year study will have the potential to provide evidence of the effects of poverty reduction on the developing child and family life. And uh, further, it's our hope that it'll, that'll, it'll inform debates both here in the US and globally on the generosity or cuts to existing safety net programs, as well as programs like tax refunds or uh, the new American child allowance that was recently implemented here because while income may not be the only or even the most important factor in determining child development, it may be one that's particularly manipulable to policy. So with that, I'm gonna thank you for your attention, say many thanks to my collaborators, lab members and generous funders, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Noble. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, we do have a few questions that we're collecting at the moment. Um, if I can start, there's one from Maureen Cronin. Uh, right at the start, you talked about the children's brains being scanned and seeing the differences that were evident there. She's asking, were the parents' brains scanned as well? See if the differences were possibly inherited rather than developmental. Right, so it's a great question. So we have not yet done work uh, scanning both parents and children, although I'll point out um, the logic there of saying it would be genetic versus environmental is not actually completely clear because for mo in most cases, the parents and the children have very similar environments. And if a child is growing up in poverty, it's highly likely that that parent did as well. So yeah. um, it's a little bit more complicated to disentangle heredity from environment uh, just by scanning the parents. Um, that said, it would certainly be worthwhile to do so. Um, and I guess the other sort of aspect of things is that um, 
people often think of heredity as meaning something is set in stone and not malleable, but that's not really true either, right? So we can think about vision, for example. You know, many people reach a certain age and have to start wearing glasses or wearing contacts. Um, exactly. Um, and so while uh, myopia or, or vision changes are frequently genetically mediated, it doesn't mean that there's not interventional environmental effects that can be had uh, through, in this case, glasses, right? A, a very simple intervention. And so just because something may be heritable, her 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 doesn't necessarily mean it can't be intervened upon. Yeah, I that that whole issue about uh, the influence of uh, genetic genetics on this is there anything in the baby's first years program that takes any account of that at all, or is it purely looking at, at the evidence that you've got from the, the brain studies? There's no correlation or-, or So we attempt. are not directly measuring genetics in no. baby's first years. We are measuring something called epigenetics or the extent to which uh, our experience influences genetic expression. So for example, there's some evidence that early adversity leads to um, acceleration of cellular aging. So we will actually be able to look and see, you know, to what extent does our poverty reduction intervention slow down aging in moms and children? Right, okay, thank you. Um, Nikki Collingwood says, uh, language differences, these cannot be seen on structural MRI. What brain scanning techniques we use to evaluate these network processes? Uh, that's right. So in that uh, MRI study I showed you, I was simply showing you that we saw brain structural differences in regions that have canonically been shown to support language and executive function. So, um, so that was a study where you know we were looking at brain structure specifically. We've done other work uh, looking. Well, we and many others have done other work looking at functional imaging as well as uh, resting EEG and ERP to get closer to function. Okay, thank you. Um, Geraldine Rowe was asking, does nursery childcare after 15 months have any impact on the low SES group? Is there any sort of measurable impact? Um, yeah, there's, uh, so not work that I've done, but there's uh, a good deal of work to suggest that high quality early childhood childcare uh, can actually be very supportive, uh, particularly for economically disadvantaged families. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nikki Collingwood again that it's surely increased income without change in experience will not have change in impact. Absolutely, right. So uh, we think of income as a distal factor. Clearly, there's nothing about a piece of plastic uh, that is going to change children's brains. So it's very much what what we very much think is that the increased economic resources lead to differences in children's environmental context and that those differences, those more proximal differences in experience are affecting the brain and behavior. But it's the income that we're uh, moving the lever on, right? So that's the experimental manipulation. Yeah. And yeah. then we're measuring those changes in context as much as we can, everything that we can think of through parent survey and, uh, to a lesser extent, video recording parent-child interactions and measuring stress hormones. Okay, I, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this one, but Catherine Jackson is asking, does playing music or having a talking radio program or talking to a child during pregnancy have any impact on the developing child's brain in, in utero? Um, so I will say somewhat. So what we know, so for example, um, infants at the time of birth prefer their mother's voice. So there's, so certainly they were, you know, mother's voice compared to other voices. So certainly there's something being learned in utero about the mother and something about familiarity, right, that is more preferable even to newborn infants compared mm. to uh, other voices. So yes, they're absorbing something, but there really isn't evidence for the, you know, baby Einstein, play your child Mozart, it's going to turn them into a, a you know, Oxford physicist uh, uh, kind of story. Okay, um, the interesting one here, would there be a difference in the choice of experiences if a study included parents who have received guidance and mentoring read the choices they make versus those who do not receive it? So separating that from income. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's a great question and we don't really know, right? So we thought very carefully, many people asked us as we were designing the study 10 years ago, you know, shouldn't we have a third arm where we, let's say, provide financial literacy or provide some other kind of parenting support? Um, and, you know, on the one hand, it's hard to know what that other third arm should be, right? How do you decide? Um, and so in the end, we decided it should really be a pure test of the effect of income in and of itself. But you could certainly imagine subsequent studies where you pair income with high quality childcare or financial literacy yeah. training or any of a number of yeah. other services. And I think it's likely that you would see some additive effects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another one here, if would increased income have a change in language quality in the home though? So if the association is with language, with more professional people using more words in front of children, then that's not going to change if you just increase people's income, will it? Uh, so we don't know, right? And um, so you could imagine a pathway by which people use the increased income to gain more education. Yeah. You could also yeah. imagine that the increased income relieves them from having to work a second job and so they're home more or it relieves their stress so they're speaking with their children more right so we we really don't know no. um we will have a little bit of information from some of the parent child activities that we're having families do in the laboratory setting but we don't have the kind of information that you'd really want you know sending a voice recorder home with the families to measure naturalistic language exposure mm. over the course of a few days mm. okay uh, well, we've actually got through the questions that we have on the chat at the moment, um, Dr. Noble, but uh, oh, one's just popped up. Uh, have you analysed how the effect differed by where the parents spent most of their increased income, i.e. going to restaurants, more on supermarkets, more on toys, so what they were spending the money on, did that have an impact? So one of the economists on the team, I should actually have backed up and I, I never fully acknowledge this is an extremely um, interdisciplinary effort uh, led by economists, psychologists, neuroscientists, social policy experts. So I uh, certainly would not want to give the mistaken impression that uh, you know, sole credit for the study should be given to me or that I've led many of these economic intricacies of the study. Um, so the transaction data uh, analysis is being led by Dr. Lisa Genetian at Duke University, who's an economist. Um, who's very interested in those kinds of questions. And so uh, she's spent a good deal of time looking through the transactions, analyzing the transactions to better understand how and when and where the money is being used. Um, and so uh, one question is exactly that kind of thing. Are we seeing um, you know, differences in how the money is being used? I can tell you some early looks suggest that uh, moms are moms in the high cash gift group are spending more money on things like books and toys compared to moms in the low cash gift group. So we are seeing some evidence for specifically right. child focused expenditures. Right. And, and that's without any prompting. That's without any. That's right. Yes, they're yeah, yeah. Use the money however they like, and there are yeah. no restrictions, and we don't give right. time. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, do you think the evidence from brain structure and function? makes it easier to convince policymakers or funders to support a direct fan financial intervention? I think it's possible, right? So I think there are multiple reasons to, to study brain structure and function, most of which are scientific reasons, right? So you can, there's some evidence to suggest that it's more sensitive than looking behaviorally, especially very early in childhood, right? It's hard to assess a 12 month old language about ability. There's not, you know, the most verbal 12 month olds are still only saying a handful of words. Um, whereas if you're able to measure their brain activity, you can get much more nuanced information. Right. To answer your question though, yes, I do also think, and there's empirical evidence to support the idea that many people find uh, you know, brain analyses more compelling than behavioral analyses alone. So while I wouldn't say that's the only reason to include yeah. um, the study of the brain, I do think right. that both policymakers and funders frequently find it compelling in a way that is less, you know, less easy uh, to convince them if you don't have the brain piece. Yeah. Sorry, I've just dropped that. Um, there's a question here, which is sort of asking if looking at nonverbal visa spatial and visa motor skills relating to quantitative thinking and reasoning 
were to be used instead of just language to assess any change in cognitive functioning. Yeah, so at age four, when we bring the families into uh, the university setting, we'll be oh. doing a range of verbal and nonverbal right. tasks. Right, right, right. So, so that covers that, and it's just not it. It expands the range of the the exercise and what people what you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, we've actually got through the questions that I've got here now, Doctor Noble. Um, there will be some more, no doubt, which we'll post for you, if that's OK, uh, after the event. But I would just like to thank, finally, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us tonight. I found the whole thing absolutely fascinating. I I'm, I'm, uh, thoroughly expect all my colleagues will as well uh, on this side. Um, we will be answering all the questions, uh, you, you know, later. So we will just ask you to answer those when we send them on, if that's OK. Um, the video, the lecture will be available on the learners website in due course when we've had a chance to edit it. Um, so other than to say this has uh, been a wonderful opportunity for us to hear about your research in the United States, um, it's also this your lecture to us forms part of what we're trying to do over here in providing people with a program events of events like this which will help our teachers uh, uh the people who construct education for us on this side of the pond to understand what neuroscientists are actually doing and what the importance of their research on what we do in schools so thank you so much for your time tonight truly my pleasure thank you for thank having you. me